thanks everyone for coming and thanks Aaron for coming as well. Uh, this is Ian Dishwell, Dish uh, Dish well, sorry, um, who's from Washington State University. Um, I thought it was natural that we invite him to give a seminar. His work is very, very similar to our interests. He does kind of information theory for Bayes Opt, he does multi-objective. Um, and I guess more recently, he's had this really interesting string of papers um, on Bayes optimization over kind of weird spaces. Um, and he's going to, I guess, talk about one of those today. Um, off you go. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Henry. Uh, before I start, so hello everyone in the back and who's attending. I really want to say I'm very thankful uh, to Henry and everyone. Um, I read a lot of papers coming out of Second Mind and people who work at Second Mind. And I always am very impressed by the kind of work. So I'm very grateful to present some of my work and I hope you'll find some of this interesting. Um, so I'll get started, I guess. So today I'm going to talk about some of our recent work on Bayesian optimization over combinatorial structures. So one thing we've realized, especially with the recent COVID pandemic, is that designing new drugs rapidly is very important for the well-being of our society. However, this traditional drug discovery process is known to be very time-consuming, and it can take multiple years before a new drug comes into the market. Having said that, this is a very large drawn out process. There is one key, uh, if I can say that, a computational component of this process, which is the molecular optimization, where what we do is we are searching over a chemical space to find molecules that satisfy certain properties of our interest. For example, we might care about high effectiveness against some pathogen. And as you might be already seeing it intuitively, this is a problem rife for Bayesian optimization uh, because evaluating most of these properties are going for each any candidate molecule that you give me is going to be very expensive and more often than not they'll be black box in nature so we are in the setting of optimizing expensive black box functions and however there is this one unique characteristic of this problem which is that Molecules are naturally represented as discrete objects. For example, strings, very popular representation of str molecules is the smile strings or molecular graphs. So today I'll be mostly talking about some Bayesian optimization technique that will focus explicitly on this special category of task where we are optimizing expensive black box functions that are defined over combinatorial and discrete structures. So, for example, sequences, sets, graphs, all those objects. So, uh, this is one very important application. And another application which I am very directly involved, especially in the chemical design, is what is called nanoporous material design. So, here again, we have this uh, choice of picking up these organic linker molecules and some nodes and composing these 3D structures into what are called as metal organic frameworks. They are also named as MOFs. And they have many sustainability use cases, including gas storage in hydrogen powered car, uh, cars. And they can also be used for separating gases in to capture carbon dioxide from power plants, for example. Moreover, like as another ap application of the similar challenges of combinatorial design space, expensive black box optimization is hardware design. So designing high performance and energy efficient chips is one of the major challenges that has huge implications for energy usage around the world. And it has been talked about in many reports, including this recent one on data centers here in the United States. Uh, and again, we are talking about a discrete search space uh, because we have these choices of what course to place in a certain node, for example, CPUs, GPUs, or memory units and where to place the links between them uh, in order to optimize, for example, latency or throughput. So all these applications that I've just talked about can formally be described as optimization over combinatorial structures. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'll be using the word combinatorial structure much more generally. And when we talk about some concrete algorithms, I'll try to pin down what special concrete uh, combinatorial structure I'm talking about. And as you know, this is not, as I just mentioned also, this is not a standard optimization problem because of the two main challenges, which is our objective function is going to be expensive to evaluate. And this will be one of the key considerations in designing algorithms as well, because we want to 
find good solutions or near optimal solutions, but also minimize the number of function evaluations. And second challenge is obviously the general hardness that usually comes when you deal with these combinatorial sites, such spaces. So how are you, how are we going to deal with that? That's another big challenge. Uh, we take the view of Bayesian optimization to accelerate this search over combinatorial structures. And I'm pretty sure everyone here is very well versed with Bayesian optimization and base of. So I'll try to give just a one minute quick intro to just for the sake of completeness. So we all know Bayesian optimization is very effective and principal framework for optimizing expensive black box functions. So it's an iterative procedure where we'll build a, where we'll build a surrogate statistical model, uh, example, a GP, using some real objective function evaluations. And then we'll use it to select the next sequence of function evaluations by optimizing an equation function. So that's the standard ways of... And so there'll be three components. Uh, one is usually the statistical model, which will act as a surrogate of the of underlying objective. And so principal uncertainty quantification is very important for Bayes opt. And that's why Gaussian processes are kind of the gold standard, in some sense, gold standard, especially in small data settings. Uh, second component is the equation function, which captures in intuitively some sort of expected utility of an input. Uh, it, there are many variety, a lot of people have worked, including at Second Mind on these uh, designing new equation functions. And then um, equation function optimize, optimization, where we actually optimize the equation function to get the next point for evaluation. And we, I'll be talking about how, especially in the combinatorial search space, this is another key thing that we need to uh, care about. So this is just standard base opt. So what is special about Bayesian optimization over combinatorial structures? So we'll have primarily two key challenges, few, which are in some sense related. So first one is obviously defining appropriate surrogate models over these combinatorial search space. How do we come up with, let's say, nice kernels if you are using Gaussian process models. And second will be the equation function optimization, as you can imagine, is going to be a hard combinatorial optimization problem. So unless we exploit some structure, we are not going to solve it to optimality in any sense. And more importantly, the key point is that these challenges are going to be related. The complexity of the equation function optimization problem is in some sense very directly proportional to the uh, complexity of our surrogate model. Uh, and we'll see in one of, the, uh, one of the algorithms that I talk about that there is a spectrum on which we can see how the choice of what kind of model that we use, we can get a certain kind of acquisition function optimization. So these are going to be the key challenges that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to talk about how some algorithms can, and we've been working on addressing some of these challenges for last two, three years. And this is a list of papers that were published, published in different conferences. Uh, I'll be very happy to talk about any one of them even later, or you can email me if you want to talk about them. But today I'm going to focus on two of our work. One of them is going to be about focusing mostly on the surrogate modeling part, which is our recent NeurIPS uh, work titled Ladder, where we basically combine this power of data-driven learned representation with these hand-designed kernel methods, which addresses the modeling, surrogate modeling part. And then I'll move on to this AAAI paper of last year, where we talk about this coupling of the modeling and the acquisition function and see how we can get actually tractable and scalable acquisition function optimization, for, which might be effective for, for example, slightly larger batch settings. So let me start with the first part. And please feel free to ask any questions whenever I stop here. So the first paper I'm going to talk about is this combining strengths of kernels and deep generative models for efficient combinatorial Bayesian optimization. So the key idea behind this paper was that we were we are trying to combine this data-driven learned, learned representation that you get from, let's say, deep generative models. Um, and these hand-designed features, so what has happened, like, so kernel methods, as we all know, and uh, probably love about it. There, a lot of people have worked on these, designing these domain-specific kernel methods and very finely tuned kernel methods, which are very effective even in very small data setting. So how can we, so this 
the key idea behind this paper was that how can we combine these two representation in some sense to get better surrogate model model and then in in turn hoping to improve vision optimization performance so that's the key idea i'll go into the detail so let's start up talking about how can we perform a very uh, probably one very straight idea of talking about vision optimization over discrete or combinatorial spaces so we know that there has been a lot of huge body of work on vision optimization over continuous spaces especially in last 15 years and uh, one way to utilize those advances from continuous spaces to discrete is to just con somehow convert a discrete search space into a continuous search space so how can we do that uh, by training for example a deep generative model using a large set of unsupervised structures and then get some sort of a continuous latent representation so again obviously we are again we are again emphasizing that uh, the supervision is at premium that's what we mean always by small data setting right that the objective function evaluations are at premium we cannot get as many as we want but there are many settings where we will have these on a large set of unsupervised structures given to you for example a large set of molecules which have not been evaluated on any real world property and we can use and that's has been the real probably the real big uh, study in the last 10 years from deep learning that we can use these representation learning methods or for example uh, an auto encoder style model where we can just encode points from a structured space through a deep neural network into a continuous latent space and we can try to learn the distribution over the input space hoping that learning this distribution will also give us some good representation uh, and uh, so then what we'll do is once we learn this continuous latent space we'll just perform our standard bayes opt in the continuous in this continuous latent space and this is what is called as latest latent space vision optimization uh, so again uh, we can just to look at what we are doing is in the standard latent space vision optimization so uh, talking about the few com the two com three components we talked about so first we'll go we are going to define a gaussian process surrogate model let's say on the latent space so this will be our standard mertern kernel gp on the latent space and the second part which is the key part is that uh, key distinction over the standard bayes opt over continuous uh, spaces that we do is that the point that is suggested by the acquisition function optimization here has to be decoded through a decoded structure for example in let's say auto encoder style models uh, to get the actual discrete structure because remember the objective function is all, all only defined on the combinatorial structure that we care about for example if we have molecules the objective function is only defined on the molecules it is not directly defined on the latent space so we have to pass it through the decoder to get the actual discrete structure before it is evaluated so this is the standard or the if i'm if i if i may call it the naive latent space vision optimization and then this approach as you can probably already intuitively see will have probably two challenges so one it is that it is not explicitly incorporating information about these decoded structures so why is this important and what what we are missing out so it is missing out on this some important representation power or inductive bias that we can get from there is this rich structural information that we have in this decoded or the combinatorial structure so what i mean by rich structural information is so all the molecules are for example or proteins are represented as graphs or sequences but they are not just any graph or sequences in the all possible space of graphs and sequences right they have this very special structure and that's what in some sense our deep even deep generative models are trying to exploit and as i referred earlier some pe people a lot of people domain experts have worked over like uh, a couple of decades to try to come up with these hand designed kernel methods or domain kernel methods which capture very important features as well so we are missing out on that rich information and uh, we also want to include it because we want to squeeze again we are in the small data setting uh, so we want to squeeze out as much as we can in our surrogate modeling at um, good get good performance so that's the first part and the second part is probably kind of related but the surrogate model may not be able to generalize well especially for the small data setting 
So primarily one reason for this is also that most of these deep generative models that we see, there are people have designed a lot of deep generative models for all kinds of structures like uh, graphs, sequences, uh, and permutations, all the possible cases. But most of the time, the latent space dimensions are very high, usually in the at least startings of 50s or 60s. And we know that standard base opt in this high dimension, at least without any assumptions. And it's probably we cannot also make any, for example, additive assumptions on the latent space because we are trying to capture this representation, right? So uh, that's another challenge that we see. And so to address both of these challenges, we provided this algorithm title ladder, uh, where the key idea is to improve the surrogate model, the Gaussian will be in the will be using a Gaussian process surrogate model with this a new kernel called structure coupled kernel and I'll just describe it now which again will try to incorporate this information that is coming both from this learned representation and also from the decoded structures. So and try to improve the surrogate model. So I'm going to describe it in detail now but uh, we hope that this approach has two key uh, advantages which is that it combines both the complementary strengths of deep generative models and structured kernels that it can leverage any advances in both. So it's agnostic of the choice of the deep generative model or the kernel that you choose. And second, we are going to perform the acquisition function optimization still in the latent space. You will see the kernel is still defined on the two points in the latent space. It takes into account the decoded structure information, but the, it is still defined on the latent space. So let's let, let me talk about the main component of ladder that is the structured coupled kernel. So what we are going to do is that the structured coupled kernel is going to combine kernels that are defined over the latent space. So let's talk about let's say some continuous space kernel, Mutton, RBF, uh, all the kernels that we use, and then some kernels that are defined over the decoded combinatorial space, which uh, we call this as structured kernels. And there are many examples of such kernels, including so, and we have seen even in Henry's work, I think it was in Europe 2020, he's shown that subsequent, for example, subsequence kernels for strings are very effective for solving these problems over, let's say, proteins and even molecule string representation of molecules. And then there are these fingerprint, other fingerprint kernels for molecules, which chemists have designed over time, which basically count these substructures while also capturing some invariance to different labelings of the atoms uh, in the molecule. You could also talk about some random walk kernels for graphs. So these are all hand-designed kernels which, have, which show very good properties. So what is the definition of our structure coupled kernel? So the key idea is that given a kernel matrix L, let's say, so we have, we have, let's say we have calculated, we have evaluated some points and we have some training data and the kernel matrix on the latent space for that training data is L. So for the points outside the training data, let's, let's call them Z and Z prime. We are going to evaluate, we are going to extrapolate the eigenfunctions of the latent space kernel by using these basis functions. Oh, this is a mouthful, but I'll, I'm going to explain it much more, uh, probably break it down from the structured kernel. So this expression, I, I'm going to go into the, the detail, uh, like uh, one way of looking at it, but this expression is nothing but a generalization of the popular Nystrom method, which is very commonly used for scaling up, which is commonly used in scaling up kernel machines. But it's the, the key idea is to extend, it's the key idea is to extrapolate eigenfunctions from a given set of point. And if you, if in fact, we can see that we can get the usual Nystrom extension equation if we replace K by L. So if we replace K by L, this is the usual Nystrom extension equation. So in some sense, intuitively, what we are doing here is that this proposed structured kernel, so on the training set itself, if you see, if you plug in K, uh, the values of K on the um, training set, we will get the exact L. So on the training set, the kernel is just the L matrix. Color matrix is this the L matrix, but outside the training set, we this structured kernel is kind of is like a smooth extrapolating kernel. So and so uh, I I'm sorry I missed this part, but so K Z here means that first we will decode the point corresponding to Z and get the combinatorial structure and decode all the points corresponding to all the training points that we have seen, and then compute this kernel between. 
So this is, and as I said, this is just, uh, so K acts like a smooth extrapolating kernel. Probably one more way to explicitly see is this, this way. Let me show you. So what do I mean by eigenfunction? So eigenfunction is just a generalization of the idea of eigenvector. We all know this is the definition. So what we do in Nystrom method is, so let's say you have collected some training data. For out points outside the training data, we'll compute the kernel using this expression, which is just a truncated version of the popular Mercer theorem. So here, so Mercer theorem says that, okay, for any two points, for any positive definite kernel, any uh, we can compute this uh, kernel as a sum of the product of the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions. So Nystrom method is just uh, a numerical approximation of it. And here, so phi i, this bar says that it's a numerical approximation. So in the standard Nystrom extension, what we do is we take this, so let's say we have calculated the kernel matrix on the training point and vi is the eigenvector of that kernel matrix. So to compute this eigenfunction or eigenvector outside the training data, so z is outside the training data, we use this expression, which is just a dot product between the kernel values and that eigenvector. So what we are doing here is we are just generalizing the coupling with using the structured kernel. So instead of L of Z, let's say we are doing this uh, uh, structured couple kernel. Uh, another way of thinking about it also, you can see this is like a mean estimate of, a, so we are trying to estimate the eigenvectors outside the training data using the structured couple kernel. So that's the general idea. So using the so we are hoping that using these domain design kernel features kernel methods which are really good on small data setting can guess get, give us good performance outside also when we are too far away let's say far away from the training set so that's the general idea um, uh, of the method and uh, yeah so we also evaluated this approach on multiple benchmarks uh, standard benchmarks so the two of them are mentioned here. One of them is arithmetic expression design, um, which is basically just finding some expression which matches a true target expression in a formal grammar. And then the chemical design where we have this large data set of molecules and we want to optimize certain property, water octane. Uh, it's a coefficient uh, property. And uh, we see that ladder did better. So again, one important point is that for every task, we have to instantiate ladder with a particular kernel. So arithmetic expression task is a string task. Uh, and here we use the subsequence kernel, which Henry also used in his paper. And for the chemical design task, we use the molecular fingerprints kernel. And we see that it performs better than the live. So the only thing changes is changing in these in this um, experiment is the surrogate model. Everything else is kept the same. So we tried both the uh, equation from zeroth order equation function optimization like CMAES and um, other like uh, second order uh, gradient information as well. And uh, so basically the figure shows the num best objective value that you have found over the number of evaluations. And ladder is also competitive uh, with many other state of the art methods that are applicable to this setting of combinatorial spaces. And we also saw with, with on more results, uh, are, we also present in the paper that this actually comes from the surrogate model where we see that the prediction performance of this new structured couple kernel is better than the standard kernel that you define, let's say on the continuous space. So uh, this was that. And now we are also working on expanding this to the nanoporous material design. Sorry, yeah. can I ask a quick question? Uh, if you go yeah. back one slide, sure. is there any, way that you can kind of work out which kind of which set i guess which kernel is is having the biggest effects on on the performance predictions and things like that yeah so i think that's a good question so one key uh, one key in, uh, top main thing that require we requires the choice of the kernel so there are different ways we as we know like so there are theoret theoretical ways to talk about which kernel will be useful in a setting so there is this notion of universal kernels which means at least we know that given enough data they will be able to so th that's they just talk about the representation power of a kernel but practically when i personally look into let's say picking up a new kernel 
most of these so intuitively when i think about especially kernels or combinatorial structures i think about in some sense they will be doing some sort of substructure counting so maybe subsequence counting subgraph counting so we have this trade off of how what how what kind of precision you want to get so how many substructures you want to count and what what pattern of substructures you count, want to count and the computational complexity so for example smaller substructures will be easy to count compared to larger ones so i think trading off this uh, how much accuracy basically how much number of how many number of substructures that we count or versus the time complexity is a good it's a good curve that we want to look at and probably we want to be on the some point in the pareto front of these curve like you put, pick up points which are kernels which are good enough but not very computationally com uh, the time is the computational complexity is not very high because we'll be evaluating them quickly again and again and i think so that's one nice thing about both the subsequent kernel in fact uh, as you know like i have also mentioned in the paper that we used uh, your subsequent kernel code which was parallelized because we can use that parallel parallel code to call the kernel again and again and fingerprint kernels are the same you can just compute the fingerprint once and do that but for example something like a weisfeller lehman kernel where we do this node curl, uh, coloring of the graphs those are going to be more and more expensive as you go higher order substructure so probably there you want to look at like lower orders so that's what i personally do yeah yeah okay yeah so yeah so and for the nanoporous material design that i talked about in the beginning we have already seen good performance on a certain data set where the input space was continuous and we are going to extend ladder to that so that's one future work uh, so this was the general idea about this paper and i'll i'll before moving to the other one i can also take some more questions i guess uh, unless i'll move to the next one okay then um, yeah I, in the end also we can take more questions uh, and I, I hope I'm clarifying because if it knows, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it again. If there is no need to go over the everything. So uh, now I'm going to talk about this other work on Mercer features for efficient combinatorial vision optimization. So this line of work, which is also followed by our recent uh, AAA paper on permutations input spaces. the So input space where, the, uh, where, we, consider, where we talk about permutations of a set of some size is basically studying this interplay between surrogate modeling and equation function optimization so excuse me so what it tries what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to we'll be trying to characterize what kind of combinatorial optimization problems do we need to solve when we solve these when we optimize the equation function and how can we somehow use this characterization in order to scale up or make our bio process more efficient so that's the main theme of this uh, this line of work. So concretely, in this paper, the key idea of this paper was that we were we are going to construct these explicit feature maps for diffusion kernels that are defined over discrete spaces. I'm going to talk about what I mean by diffusion kernels now. And so we know that uh, most Gaussian processes are mostly characterized by the choice of the kernel and. Uh, there is also the mean function, but I would probably everyone would argue that kernel is the most interesting piece for uh, defining a Gaussian process model. So we are going to the key idea behind this paper was coming up with these explicit feature maps for diffu discrete diffusion kernels. And then, so what do we do with these feature maps? So what they are going to do us give us is we are they are go going to give us this closed form expression for sampling from the GP procedure, very similar to what we do with random Fourier features, right? We construct these random Fourier features for uh, RBF kernels, and then we uh, we take this parameterized approximation to the GP posterior, and that helps us in this very easy sampling from the posterior and optimization. So this is going to be a very similar thing, and as we know that optimizing. Uh, sampling from the posterior, sampling a function from the posterior and optimizing it is a very common step in multiple equation functions, including Thomson sampling and all the entropy-based methods. 
and that's why probably a little cheesily but we were also thinking of it as a uh, bridge between continuous spaces and discrete spaces because you can sample this uh, approximate posterior and optimize it um, so this this part of the talk is mostly focused on the binary input space where we have these sequences of binary structures for categorical variables you can encode them as binary variables so we're not talking about for example graphs as such here unless there is an encoding of graph into the binary structures uh, so again, um, if we are going to talk about some input space and we are going to use Gaussian processes, let's say as, as our surrogate model, we need to define a kernel. So we use this uh, diffusion kernel, which basically, so the key idea here is that given, let's say, a graph, so give you give me a graph representation of the input space, such that the entire input space is represented by the graph. So each point in the input space is some node in the graph. So the kernel between, so the diffusion kernel is used to define kernel between two nodes of a graph. So again, if you're somehow your input space is represented as a graph, then you can define the kernel between two points as this kernel between the two nodes of the graph. And the expression is that we are just taking the um, exponentiated minus uh, of the Laplacian of the graph. So Laplacian of the graph is uh, a very important object of study in spectral graph theory and a lot of uh, other related uh, fields. And people have studied a lot of properties of this graph, uh, of this object for many different kinds of graphs. And in fact, this diffusion kernel is also very related to the RBF kernel. So it's you can, in some sense, approximately think of it as like a discretization of the RBF kernel. So RBF also has this notion of diffusion. So this Laplacian object can also be defined on any other fancy geometries like Riemannian geometry and other ge uh, other geometries. So you, and uh, that's how one derivation of RBF kernel is through. You can we can do that as well. So how so what representation do we use? We use this representation from a paper earlier in Europe 2019, which is this Hamming graph representation actually, where so each each point in the input space, so each input in our binary space is going to be represented as a single node in the graph. And uh, all my neighbors or my one edge neighbors are going to be one Hamming distance away. And uh, this is one concrete representation when we let's say have three, the input dimension, input spaces of the dimensionality three, and there are two possibilities binary. So we have these eight nodes. So, so the graph is, in terms of representation, it's going to be a exponentially sized uh, in the number of nodes graph. But one key characteristic of this Hamming graph is that you can decompose it as a graph Cartesian product over subgraphs. So you can take this subgraphs over each individual dimension, which will be a single two node single edge graph. And then if you take the Cartesian product of them, you'll get the exact same Hamming graph. And this is what we are going to I'm for, for telling it, but we are going to use the properties of this Cartesian product to come up with this explicit feature map. Can you explain a bit about the... Yeah. Uh, so the kernel is defined as KVV equal exponential yeah. B Laplacian of the graph, but where is the B? So in, in the, on the right-hand side. Oh, you're talking about the beta, beta parameter? Yeah. I'm talking about the uh, VAP, K, VAP, B, B. Right. Oh, on the right. Yeah, so it's not on the... So the right representation, we are going to use it to compute the kernel, but for thinking about where it is defined. So the, the reason KVV, I've written it is because it's the original formulation. When you, let's say, have a finite size graph, so the Laplacian will also be the size of the adjacency matrix and you will get an output of the entire kernel matrix. But in our case, because the graph itself is going to be two to the power n size, we are not going to be able to compute the Laplacian directly. What we are going to do is we are going to use the second high, the right hand side that you're talking about, use this decomposition to compute this Laplacian little bit smartly uh, and only use it where, on the points that we have evaluated. So the KVV, which where V here represents the entire node set will be restricted to the node set that we have evaluated. So the training data that we have. So uh, okay. I'm- okay. thanks. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, and this, in fact, this is one uh, going, you can look at the expression. So uh, the same thing, the kernel, which I just wrote over the entire node space as VV, if you want to talk about two points in the input space, let's say X1 and X2, these are binary sequences. Using again Mercer theorem, we can write it as this expression. So here, uh, lambda i and the ui are the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix. So because this graph is uh, ideally exponentially sized when we have this combinatorial input space, this Mercer theorem will also expand into exponential number of terms. And that's what I've just written the X Mercer theorem here. Uh, I, we are going to expand it out, but this is just the starting. And this is one way, in fact, to uh, look at how it is, uh, what is the value of the kernel for an individual, two individual points. And now what we are going to do is that we are going to come up with these exact values for the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, and then we'll plug them those values and we'll get a uh, closed form expression. So that's going to be the key idea. And for that, we again exploit this. So the structure, I, as I mentioned, is the decomposition of the original representation into these graph cartesian products so i'm going to use these three properties from uh, spectral graph theory about uh, laplacians of graphs so graph laplacian actually decomposes over subgraphs so this is one key property that if you have computed this laplacian over these individual two node graph that i was talking about you can compute the entire Laplacian by using this just Kronecker sum operation. And Kronecker sum is associative as well. So you can do it in arbitrary order. And then there's this recursive property, one more nice property about graph Laplacian and the eigenspace of graph Laplacians is that once you, let's say, have uh, this eigenspace, eigenvectors, and eigenvalues for two graphs, if you want to compose them through the Cartesian product, which we did, then we can get the, the eigenspace also again in a recursive form. So here, uh, this uh, this operation is basically just pair all pairwise sum of eigenvalues. So take set all pairwise sums from the two sets, and this is just the Kronecker product operation. So now, as you can imagine, because what is our individual unit? So once we have decomposed our graph into these two node uh, two node single edge. Uh, individual unit, we, if we can compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of those units, we can just compose them using this uh, recursive uh, operation property of Laplacian and get our uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues in the closed form. So for those, it's very easy to compute. The eigenvalues are going to be 0, 2, and these eigenvectors are going to be this. And then, so then we can recursively compute these properties, and we see that the eigenvalue set is going to be, so there will be n distinct eigenvalues, which will be these even number of eigenvalues. And the jth eigenvalue will occur with a certain multiplicity. The, that jth eigenvalue will occur with n choose j times in our set. So there will be two to the power n eigenvalues. And another thing is that the eigenvector set that I just talked, so this eigenvector of this, uh, this thing like of a single unit, is also called what is called the is known as the Hadamard matrix of order one, and we can see that recursively computing the Hadamard matrices from the second property, we can get that the eigenvector set is going to be Hadamard matrix of order two to the power n, and again using these properties of these Hadamard matrices that you can get any point you want to evaluate. This is again two to the power n times two to the power n matrix, but any po any value in the matrix, any element of the matrix, ij, let's say, can be calculated like this, uh, which is minus one to the power of this ri, rj. So ri is basically, so if let's say you want to uh, calculate the value of this matrix at some point three and five, i is three and j is five. So you represent uh, i as a binary uh, value. So you represent it as a binary representation of three and um, Rj will be binary representation of five, and this compute the just compute the dot product, and you get this value. So plugging these facts, uh, in some sense, we can just uh, so I'm just plugging the eigenvector here, and we know the eigenvalues. So we have separated out the two terms, and we can write this as a feature. So both of them as a feature. So we get this feature set. 
So the features are basically, again, still the features are exponentially sized. We are going to talk about uh, truncated them and using them. And this is this this feature is what we call as the Mercer features because uh, they are derived from the Mercer theorem directly. And for the Jth, I you can see that they grow in this power of uh, in this uh, in the step size of n choose j because every eigenvalue occurs. Um, as I said, there is this multiplicity of n choose j for every jth eigenvalue. So they will grow very. So the features will grow as the num as as we choose new eigenvalues. So this is the definition of the Mercer features. So now what we can do is obviously they are exponentially sized. What we get, so natural question is okay. We started with an exponentially sized graph. We got these exponentially sized features. What is the use? So now, similar to what we do in random Fourier features, we can just truncate them. And here, the truncation can, in fact, be defined by the number of distinct eigenvalues you choose. Uh, and this is this is also motivated from the choice of the kernel as well. That already, so if you so if you look at the def idea, the definition of the diffusion kernel, what we did there was we by taking that exponential, we are penalizing the lower end the higher end eigenvalues anyways. So in some sense, we what we care about to define these uh, some sort of smooth functions on graphs uh, is that we want to care about these lower eigenvalues more. So the Mercer features again are going to be defined by, so if you take a uh, low number of distinct eigenvalues, you will get low number of Mercer features. So that's the idea. So for example, if you take uh, two two distinct eigenvalues, you will get order of n square, where n is the input space, uh, input space dimension, uh, order of n square uh, features. And so again, because these are uh, explicit features, we can sample from the GP posterior how, like we can construct uh, approximate parameterized posterior. So uh, again, in the weight space representation of, we all know there is this weight space representation of Gaussian processes where we can equivalently represent them as this Bayesian linear regression in the feature space of the kernel. And we have this feature space using the Mercer feature for diffusion kernel. So we can just do our Bayesian linear regression in that feature space. Obviously, again, using a truncated version of the Mercer features. And then you can leverage it to uh, sample a uh, function from the GP posterior and then approximate GP posterior and then do all our uh, uh, nice equation functions that we care about. So that's what I've just written here. For a, and one special, one very popular one and which is very amenable to scaling to large batch sizes, uh, we have seen and a lot of second mind work has also focused on that is Thomson sampling, where we sample uh, again, in this case, we will be sampling uh, this weight vector uh, or like the weights in the Bayesian linear regression uh, formulation. And then we'll compute this function as the dot product of the weight vector, sampled weight vector and the features, the Mercer features here. So another nice thing that turned out in this case was Mercer features was that this for a second order for a, some class of Mercer features, for the second order Mercer features, we can get Excuse me. So we can get this. Uh, so the this sample, this Bayesian linear estimate, and if you optimize this Thomson sampling, let's say, what we get is this very popular, very well studied problem of binary quadratic program. So this problem is very well studied in combinatorial optimization. This is NP hard in general, obviously. So, uh, and uh, but we can in use these very nicely, very, very effective uh, solvers, which solve this problem uh, and get us good solutions in very quick time. And we use this uh, some modular relaxation solver where basically what you do is that, so some modularity is property of the, of uh, let's say a set function. And you can think of a binary input space as a set function. Like for example, we can talk about, uh, so whenever, uh, an input dimension is one, that point is included in the set and others are not. So that's how we define submodularity here. So obviously in general, this objective is not submodular, but we can construct this lower bound, submodular lower bounds. And those submodular lower bounds are solved by these graph cut algorithms. And they are 
implemented in like very fast libraries that solves in fractions of milliseconds. And then we can also optimize over this relaxation that we, this our modular relaxation to get better estimates of our objective and get better solutions. So this is one nice thing that came out with these Mercer features that was certain class of them gave out this uh, optimization problem, which we know how to solve from, and a lot of people have worked even in computer vision, this is a very well studied problem. And this also points back to the point that I was mentioning earlier that by looking at these Mercer features and what we get was we see that at what order of truncating them, what kind of combinatorial optimization problem we get. So you can see if we had taken only, let's say single order uh, Mercer features, you will get a linear combinatorial optimization problem, which is slightly more easier to solve. When we get the second order, we get this binary quadratic program. So we are already at this boundary of the hardness of the kind of problems that we can solve. Higher orders are going to be much more difficult. Yes. So uh, that was one thing about this idea. So this was the main general description. Uh, we have other experiments in that paper, but I'm going to talk about this biological sequence design because it rightly points out to one key thing that we can get. As we know with Thomson sampling, parallel, parallelizing or getting more batches is very nice, very easy. Uh, so we can just sample as many uh, functions, as many weight vectors from the posterior and compute these in parallel. So, and that's, and it is this, this density data of parallel is very important in this biological sequence design, where we have to design these uh, sequences, which we, which for example, as, as I said, so these are the key residue data. We, we want to have high diversity of the structure. So, we want to do more than one evaluation, batch evaluation in each step. We want to have high diversity. We want to do them in parallel. And in some sense, sometimes we want this real-time acceleration. In most of the cases, we care about, uh, obviously, the objective function is going to be so expensive that it is never going to match uh, probably uh, the, um, the amount of time that we use for our model and the base of procedure. But in some cases, especially let's say if we are doing a lot more evaluations or if we are in silico, we are doing it not in the lab, then we also care about this real-time acceleration, how fast we get those new batches as well. And so we evaluated this on this very standard benchmark of maximizing this binding activity of um, these DNA sequences. And we compared both parallel expected improvement and parallel version of this th Thomson sampling with these Mercer features and the submodular relaxation optimization. So we saw that Thomson sampling is, in terms of performance, it's not outperforming expected improvement, which kind of is also we have seen in a lot of other benchmarks that expected improvement does give very good performance. But in terms of real-time acceleration, because of this batch sizing, and very uh, high scalability of Thomson sampling, we get similar solutions much faster. And the, I have listed down the values that we get at the final point. Uh, so you can see they are very similar compared to expected improvement. Um, and uh, Thomson sampling also has better improvement with batch sizes. And this primarily comes from this, uh, this is specifically for this setting, because as I said, Diversity was a key, key criteria for biological sequence design and Thomson sampling found much more diverse um, structures. And the metric we use was this mean having distance, which is again a um, metric that other people have used as well. So this was one key, there are other uh, applications as well, but uh, I felt this was the one critical application that was very, useful and very amenable to this setting. So I think this is kind of towards the end of my talk, but in summary, I think um, I was trying to just convey that how Bayesian optimization for combinatorial structures has very high potential for accelerating scientific discovery and in a lot of other applications. And there are a lot of open challenges, uh, a lot of other domains to work on. Um, so I'll be very happy to discuss and hear about other ideas. Um, also, I want to acknowledge all my uh, collaborators and my friends who have helped me in this. 
and i have to say really sorry for lot because i'm i'm pretty sure i missed down on very relevant references but we just gave this tutorial in triple ai this year when we have this list of references hopefully that will cover up but uh, i'm sorry if i've not covered some particular reference that was required so many other people are doing really great stuff now in this domain especially because it's very relevant as i've said to molecular design and protein design and uh, these are very important applications so many people are picking up uh, this direction as well and uh, henry's work was there in earlier and year 2020 so yeah and the, the code is also out on my github if you want to look at uh, probably i can take more questions now yeah thank you Yeah, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I've I've got a, a question maybe to, to kick things off. Right. Um, so I wondered. So this is about the first half of the talk. So when you okay. make a given prediction from this this model that combines the the latent space okay. and the structured kernel, right. is there any way to work out like which source of information is is more useful for a particular prediction? So like, is it using the the kind of the the latent space bit, or is it using the the structured kernel bit? Is there any way of just dis disentangling the two? Yes, yes. I think that's an interesting question. So, right. Uh, to, I think there is this, obviously there is this ablation experiment you can do where you can use the same, let's again, like when I talked about that, we are generalizing the Nystrom extension equation. So let's use the existing one with the latent space kernel and with the structured kernel. So that's kind of the ablation that we have done where we see, uh, okay, when we use just the latent space and when we use the structured kernel, it does win. And probably uh, that's something, uh, but you might say that for doing, doing that for every experiment is probably cumbersome. So another way to probably look at it, it could be in terms of complementary ways where we have complementary settings. So for, for example, let me give you an, an, another example. So now a lot of these molecular design, so molecules can be represented in different representations, sequences, graphs, and there is this point cloud representation as well, where we also care about, let's say, in, so let's say we care about some other symmetries that let's say symmetry to periodicity or other something else. And someone gave me, and we know that a lot of people are working on these equivariant models, deep generative, deep models for equivariance. Someone gave you a model for that equivariance part. And it is, we know it works well, it captures the symmetry, but you also want to add this extra information. So another way to look at it is to couple these two different in, input space representation as well. So let's say the deep, the learned representation is giving you these symmetries the equivariant symmetries for let's say point cloud representation and the kernels are these structured kernels are defined on sequences so you are cap so you are coupling this power of symmetries in the point cloud representation and the power of this string representation so that's another way to look at but uh, Anna, yeah still i think empirically evaluating just the exact contribution is something very interesting to see because that's some I, I see the point that we, whenever we want to look at, let's say, a new setting, we don't want to go through the entire process, setting up it. We just want to see whether there is a separate way to do. Uh, but yeah, I think these are the thoughts I have in mind right now. And another way probably just to expand on that is like, uh, yeah, but it's kind of going back to the same ablation that, so if you, yeah, you can, yeah, it's, yeah, it's going to back to the same ablation, but if you add uh, some sort of a parameter that captures, like a hyperparameter that captures the difference. So um, let me go back to the slide. So here we can also add like some parameter, let's say K plus Lambda I. So as we know, like that Lambda is going to act like 
if that lambda is higher value, then we are diminishing the power of the structured kernel and adding, keeping the latent space kernel more, but still probably it's not still an empirical value to give you the difference. Yeah, that's for sure. Great, thanks. Um, I've uh, yeah. My second question is about the second half. Yeah. It might be nonsense, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So you oh, said that sure. your your graph, the graph setup here, so this graph kernel, okay. there are ways of kind of like if you push it uh, onto yeah like a continuous space, you can show it becomes right. the RBF kernel. Right, right. So your approximation of this kernel in the discrete set, if you, is there like an argument to be made where you can show that your approximation on this discrete set, if you push it into the continuous domain, becomes an approximation that we know already? Like, would it correspond to an like RFF or? Uh, yeah. Like, what would that, it correspond to exactly? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. So, uh, okay, so this one, uh, I think it will not directly correspond to RFF for, Primarily, like one okay, one thing I again like one key in some sense limitation of this idea is that it's assuming a certain so this decomposition that we are assuming it turns out well in experiments, but it's a very specific decomposition, right? Like, so it's not uh, probably in some cases we might not have this kind of uh, specific uh, specific uh, decomposition. So if if I had assumed like a very general representation. So if I had not assumed any properties of this Cartesian sub product and then came up with a feature, then they will have a direct analog. So, but here there is this extra thing that I, I'm assuming that we can decompose it into this graph Cartesian product. So that is giving me this way to compute these Mercer features. So it's like, it's like a subset of all the possible like class of features that you can construct. So Probably it can map to some subset, but not directly to RFF, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't think it wouldn't be RFF anyway, because I guess this is kind of deterministic to some extent. But yeah, um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's deterministic. Yeah, I, I just wondered what, yeah, what, what it kind of related to in a, in a non graph setting. Um, but yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from, from the room? I uh, had a quick one regarding the code. Uh, out of curiosity, what what framework you used? Did you uh, have to face particular challenges because it looks like daunting? Yeah, so the, that's another in, in very nice question. So the thing is, most of the frameworks, as you said, uh, so I started in the beginning by writing my own GP code, which was, again, not very nice, I guess. Uh, um, then I moved on to other frameworks uh, built on different packages, including TensorFlow, PyTorch, and other existing uh, packages. Uh, but the biggest issue is the representation. Uh, in most of these, most of the packages which are existing assume a vector representation for the input, which is which are and which is uh, which makes sense as well because most of the bo uh, a lot of big applications of bayesian optimization has been to continuous spaces so one big challenge i faced was the representation let's say for this is about using existing libraries is that because they don't support known vector representations uh, and there are issues on every kind of lab package out there talking about this probably uh, it's difficult to, you have to come up with some hacks how to represent your graphs or your sequences and others. Um, and uh, so automatic hyper, auto, so uh, the automatic differentiation part gets also a little trickier because of that. So, because you need, even though you don't need it for equation function optimization, but you still need it for, let's say, hyperparameter optimization of the GP, right? So that has always been uh, tricky. So I would still say that representation in the, all these codes is going to be, the input representation is a little hacky in most of the codes in the sense that I have represented graphs as a single vector sometime uh, or some like keeping some indexes for uh, like storing, so, so doing some bookkeeping all the time that is always involved in these uh, structures so this that's what been my experience and but 
the reason still i sometimes try to do that hacking is like if you use existing packages defining these other baselines or using equation functions become very natural otherwise if you create your own package i guess you have to come up with your own define your new equation like if implement your equation functions from scratch probably that's not very effective use of time that way so i've still tried to use it but i think one thing in any if if i could add if i could help if i could wish for any in, in a new library is something a good support for these representations like a graph is not going to be a single vector it will also have let's say a adjacency matrix um uh, and for example there might be some constraints like the other paper that we talked about uh, i didn't talk about recent triple ai paper where we have permutations of the entire input space so let's say you are given 10 10 points and you want to take all permutations so but not all combinations are possible so permutations you can take the 10 factorial permutations but not each in, so it's it's different than this let's say binary sequence or categorical in categories every input has certain number of categories that you can choose but in permutations you can only permutate the given set of ob objects you have so there are these constraints that you start adding on the input set that are again you know because when you like so these are the things probably you have to take care more of yeah Uh. Yeah, that's that's great. I'll stop the recording.